over again. This is worth hearing. Andrew was out getting ready to, to cut a tree down and the tree said, wait, I'm a talking tree. And Andrew said, you're about to be a dialogue. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your Holy Spirit to take the words of Scripture and apply them and graft them to our hearts that we might understand things in a new way. And I sense the Lord saying in a new way that makes this a new day that from this day things will progress, move forward and accelerate. So Lord, let that be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 1, and I'm preaching a different way like I did last week and will be for a little while, where if you have your Bibles, I just ask you to open them up. And today I'm going to say pretty much in John. But I want you to hear the Word of God and what God is asking us and speaking to us through the Word of God. And in John chapter 1, we hear the question, are you, are you a voice in the wilderness? John 1.19 says, now this is a testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? People won't trust your message. They won't trust what you're saying. They will not trust your witness until they know you can trust you. You've heard it said people won't care how no, or don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's sometimes there's evangelists around and they try to get you all fired up and try to get you to grab your Bibles and memorize a Roman road and go out knocking on doors and, and trying to get people saved. And I'm certainly not against that. Heaven knows we need more people that are sharing the good truth about Jesus. But think of how Jesus did it. Jesus developed relationships with people. People listened to Jesus, not because he wanted to sell them his program, but because he genuinely took an interest in them. He loved them. He shared with them. He listened to them. And this morning I was thinking about this. Way back when I was first saved, my hero was was Ken Galbraith. He played the guitar so well that I bought a guitar and tried to teach myself to play steel strings. I never did learn how to play that guitar. But he, he was just a young man, young married man and youth pastor at our church. I wanted to be like him. And one day we had this unsaved young person there and I told that young person everything that I knew trying to get him to save. And I was kind of hoping that Ken would say, good job, Doug, you, you were really witnessing today. Fact is, the kid didn't get saved, and I made little impression. And I looked, why does Ken impress people to come to Jesus, and I didn't? Because Ken loved them. He listened to them. He paid attention, attention to them. But back to John the Baptist, people wanted to know who he was. And many were sincere. John, who are you? But others were just trying to, to operate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they, they wanted to make a mental, a soulish decision about him. But John chapter 1, verse 20 reveals that John didn't pretend to be anyone other than who he was. He confessed, he did not deny, he conf but he confessed, I am not the Christ. Notice how emphatic that was. He, he confessed, he did not deny, but confessed. Twice in the same sentence, he confessed, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He didn't want people to think he was the answer. He, he didn't want people to think that he knew everything. He wanted people to know that he knew the one that was coming who does know everything. You see the difference? When, when we make it about Jesus, we share what we... What, who we are, we don't pretend to be who we, we aren't be or even who we want to be. We just share Jesus w with other people. And you know, I thought when I was doing this, I am so glad I'm not the Pope. I mean, for several re years, I, reasons. I, first of all, I like being married. But man, I would hate to have people think I was infallible. I would disappoint them all the time. 
And I'm not going to try walking on the water just because people think I should. I do so much better walking under the authority of the one who can walk on the water. I find this interesting. 1,700 pastors leave the ministry every month. 50% of ministers who start out well will quit within five years. One of every 10 ministers who begin pastoring earlier in, in, in their lives, only one out of 10 actually retire from the ministry. 4,000 new churches start every year in America. Great news, don't you think? 7,000 churches in America close every year. We're in a war that we will not win by trying to pretend to be something we aren't. We'll win it when we find out who we are and who God has called us to be and simply relax and, and be that. And I think of Pastor Ross Gerber and, and Bob Brunner that, that retired at the end of last year. Ross actually a year before that retired from the ministry. They started when they were young. They started well. They, they continued well. They finished well. They are still doing well. Ross is running a big ministry in Uganda from Sturgis and going there three or four times a year. Uh, Bob is going to the jail twice a week, night, uh, a week now to, uh, to minister to people in the jail. But they simply went about their business being who they were. And I so honor and respect them for that. They both learned what John the Baptist knew. You can represent Jesus, but you cannot be Jesus. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. And Hebrews says that God the Father will never leave us or forsake us. But any pastor, any minister, any church member who tries to be all things to all people will not only burn out, but he'll leave people behind them that, that are burned out. No wonder so many people are, are burned out. And I know churches that expect their pastors to do everything. My very first church I was expected to mow the lawn, do the office work, run the duplicator, Rex Rotary duplicator. I'll tell you, that thing made me lose my sanctification every single week. <laughs> it did break me of perfectionism. <laughs> no wonder that so many people make it. And even in the church, sometimes if somebody gives a little, we take more and more and more and more. And I hate to say this, but I need to say this. It's okay to say, I don't think I'm called to that. Or I think I want to retire from that. It's okay to do only what God is telling you to do. John 1.21 shows us if we don't make our role clear, people will project their personal thoughts and desires on you and on me. John 1.21 says, and they asked him, John the Baptist, what then, are you Elijah? He said, nope. Are you the prophet? He said, nope. And I have no idea how long this conversation went on between these people and John the Baptist, but people are always trying to label other people. Think of it, are you Baptist, Pentecostal, Baptocostal? Are you pre, mid, or post rapture? Are you amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial? And people are trying to either label you or try to get you to fit in their label. And, and I think that's what the Pharisees were trying to do. I think that's what everybody tries to do. In the beginning, God made man in his own image. And ever since then, God has been trying to make man in their own image and that just doesn't work and the Pharisees thought well well if Jesus or if John was Elijah then we're going to watch and see if he can raise some somebody from the dead or maybe he'll be able to put down King Herod and and, and get things changed for for our nation and then John 1 and 22 exposes how there are people who want to use your call against you look at it then they said who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us, what do you say about yourself? And do you notice that the people that were asking the questions had no personal stake in the issue? They weren't planning on becoming John's disciples. They were just digging 
for dirt like the false media does. They tried to discover or create things John might say or do to take back to their leaders who would use fake news to try to impeach him. Does that sound familiar? If the leaders were really so concerned about John, why didn't they talk to him personally? Why didn't they listen to him? I started pastoring again in Sturgis on August 30, 1992. I had black hair back then. I was 20, 30 pounds lighter. I didn't have a beautiful wife back then. But Pam joined me a year and then three months later. And uh, it's, been a great, it's been a great journey. But there's some things we've learned. Non-Christians don't hurt you. At least not very often. Oh, they can talk about you. They can run their mouths about. But it's not non-Christians who hurt you. It's Christians that, that hurt you the most. I, I remember when, when people who um, uh, reported things that they didn't understand about us who, to leaders who cared even less about us. And we've truly forgiven those people who went to state leaders behind our backs to report what they judged us to be. But we had to learn we're not fighting flesh and blood. But we're fighting corporate spirits of religion, just like Jesus did, just like John the Baptist did. And I need to pause to thank God. I am so thankful for those who loved us enough to get to really know us and see us for who we really are and still somehow amazingly like us. We're so thankful for people like that. And isn't that what everybody wants is people that will accept them as you are, embracing you complete with all your warts and wrinkles. John chapter 1 verse 23 shows us a great strength in John. This is a hard one to learn. He didn't try to defend himself. He merely reported who God said he was. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. Now, I'm glad I'm not the Pope, and I'm really glad I wasn't called to be John the Baptist. I'm not sure I would look good in camel skins. I know I wouldn't like eating locust. And the idea of having my gray head cut off and shown around in a, on a silver platter, it's just not, although it would match, on a silver platter, but that's not appealing to me. It's a terrible mistake when we try to make ourselves or try to make other people something or something that God did not create them to be. This is so important. John didn't try to be what people thought he was. He didn't try to be what people wanted him to be. He didn't project an image of who he dreamed being. Instead, he discovered who God called him to be and created him to be, and he was faithful in that which is least until God gave him more. And I cry out to you today from heaven. I think God is crying out. Be true to who God created you to be. Be true to the call that he placed on your life, and do not forsake the tenor of your way that he made you to be. And then John kept focus on prophetic words he knew that pointed to him. He must have been very familiar with the Old Testament, although it was just the Torah and the writings back then, the, the prophetic writings. But he read in Isaiah and Malachi, and God often highlights verses as we read through them, and we know that God is personally speaking to us, and that's how it was with John. He knew that God was speaking specifically to him and about him when he read Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John knew that he knew that he knew that Malachi 3, 1 described God's call on his life. That verse reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. 
When people sincerely seek first the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter if they're a young person, a teenager. It doesn't matter if they're uh, young or middle-aged or, or older or retired. It doesn't matter. When people seek first the kingdom of God, God shows them what they're supposed to do. And God will bring prophetic words that will guide them. And God will show them things that will spur them on to do the extra and the extraordinary that God has in their lives. Now, I am fascinated by how God works. Last Sunday, I tried to rest. I always try to rest. I know I'm supposed to rest on Sundays. Pam rests really well. She's gifted at it. I'm not so gifted. So after a bout of resting, I got on my computer and started, I've never done this before, I started looking at my downloads, opening them to see what they were, and giving them titles so I could find them again. I ran across pictures I forgot that we had of our trip to Israel, and that was fun. And then on Monday, I didn't get done. So Monday, I took a longer than normal lunch break so I could run home and, and turn the sprinkler on my garden. And I had just finished, before I left, I had just finished on John uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And I knew where I was starting when I would get back right here. I'd be starting. And so I got the sprinkler going, ate my lunch quickly, ran out, you know, I ran out of food and ran out of room to put more food. So I, I got my computer out and started looking at downloads again. Wouldn't you know, I came to an image. I didn't know what an image was. I figured it would be a picture. It wasn't a picture. It was a voice of one call, crying out in the wilderness. Actually, it was a voice of, of Cindy Williams who called me on August 14th, 2014. And she prophesied, she prophesied, and part of it was, you need to downsize, you need to shore your things up, you need to be pre prepared because you'll be going out and coming back in, you'll be ministering outside the local church more and more. And she went on and on about this. Now it was interesting, it was August 14. The week before, I talked with Pam and said, do you think we ought to think about downsizing? Maybe we should think about moving to a lake property or something on a river somewhere. And she said, I'm willing to look, but wait for me. The house we bought before that, we kind of bought quicker than she was ready to, and I'm still sorry I did that. But wait for me. And we actually had gone that, that Saturday, maybe it was a Sunday afternoon, we drove out to a place that was going to have an open house. And we drove out that beautiful lake property on, on Aldridge Lake and we walked around it. We even looked in the windows and we thought, well, this might work. So we went to the open house and nobody was there. We thought that's strange, not even the realtor. So on Monday, I called the realtor and said, what happened? He said, well, it was sold the, the day before the open house was supposed to be. But it put us on a journey. Now, remind you, Cindy Williams called on August 2014. She confirmed some things that God had been saying to me for years and some things that my prayer partner has never let me forget, that God had a call on my life and it wasn't being here all the time. It was going where God would be sending me. And so on 20, August 14, 20. 14, God gave that prophecy. On October 24, we moved. Before that, we had sold our house and we'd scheduled a auction so we could downsize. You see, God is always wanting to confirm words that he has said. And sometimes, I, I keep mine on a computer. If I write it down in my own handwriting, I, I can't remember it. I can't read it. So I, I keep them on my computer. And everything, now and then, God says, I want you to go back. I want you to see what I've already spoken to, to you. There's a secret about God's will. God will seldom reveal to you what you're supposed to do next until you finish what he's already told you to do. And sometimes we need to look, look back to go ahead. Now, John chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 poses a challenge. The challenge is this. Don't be surprised when you are challenged about your authority to do things in the name of the Lord. 
verse 24, and those who were sent, those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why do you baptize if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? And the Pharisees couldn't stand that when John the Baptist and Jesus did things, they were too religious or too powerless or too unbelieving to do. Trust me, that ugly demon is all over Christianity to this day. And if you dare to lay hands on the sick and see them healed, somebody's going to find fault with you for doing that. And if you dare say to a demon, come out in Jesus' name, and it comes out, somebody's going to make fault with you for doing that. It's not your problem, it's their problem. They're too religious, they're too stupid to open up their ears and their eyes and to hear what Jesus Christ is saying to his church today. So they drag around with their feet in the mud, staring where they had always been, when God is saying, I've got something better for you, and I want to use you to start new things that go beyond the old things that don't work anymore. You know why they don't have Sunday church, church on Sunday nights anymore? People don't come. I tried it. I did it for years. And I thought if only two or three of you are going to come, I'm not going to study 10 hours for two or three people. I love the two or three, but I'm not going to do it. And Wednesday night prayer meeting, I used to tell people, if you, if you love, how was it? If you love the church, you'll come on Sunday mornings. If you love the pastor, you'll come Sunday nights. If you love Jesus, you'll come on Wednesday nights. That kind of logic doesn't get people anywhere anymore. I've tried it. A couple of years ago, I started Wednesday night Bible studies and prayer meetings. Two or three people came, and then one person came, then nobody came. I'm not going to do that if you're not going to do that. You see, we need to find out what God's doing and join Him instead of trying to rely on what we used to do that no longer works. I'll never forget the day I've always prayed for the sick. I've always believed in John 5, 13 to 16. Always. Always anointed people with oil. The only problem was nobody was ever healed. I mean, maybe if they had surgery, they'd be healed. But we never saw anybody healed. And then one day I was minding my own business during a deliverance appointment, and I asked Jesus to heal a man, and he said, no, you heal him. I said, I'm not the healer. He said, heal them. I said, that's your job. He said, heal them. You see, he was trying to build a prototype in my mind that said Jesus is going to do all these things. When Jesus, read the New Testament, said in my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. You will cast out demons. You will speak in other tongues. You will make disciples of all nations. And see, we've tried to, tried to get out of the responsibility and the privilege and the calling that Jesus has given us because we're not even reading the Bible right. Same thing happens, happened the very first time I cast a demon out of somebody. I didn't believe in it. I thought that was what those wacky people did, those charis charismatics, I called them. And this lady came to me for counseling, and she, she was hooked on gambling. She got saved. She quit drinking. She quit living with a man. Started coming to church, very faithful. And she came up after church and said, Pastor, I need help. I'm addicted to gambling. I was so naive, I didn't think you could gamble if you lived in Sturgis. I didn't know there was opportunity to gamble unless it was a game of poker or something. But she kept talking. I kept hearing this little voice saying, cast out the spirit of gambling. And I don't believe in that. Cast it out. Now, I, I'm not a deliverer. Cast it out. He, just, he was insistent. It's like God thinks he's boss or something. And finally, to get, and I wanted to go home. I'm, I get hungry. I, I work hard on Sunday mornings. I, I was ready to go home. And finally, so she would leave, and I get to go home, and so God would quit bugging me. I said, you demon, you spirit of gambling, come out in Jesus' name. Nothing manifested, 
And actually, Pam and I left on a vacation back when we used to take vacations. We left on vacation after church that day and was going to be gone for two weeks. I came back expecting to counsel that woman once a week for two or three years, trying to help her get over gambling. And when I saw her, I said, how you doing with your gambling? She said, I haven't been tempted to gamble once since you prayed for me. I was kind of shocked and amazed. And so I said, well, how bad was it? And she said, it's all I could think about. I dreamed about it when I was awake, when I was sleeping. My mind was caught in gambling. And I said, had you ever been able to quit before? She said, I, I, I quit one time for, for, for a whole month. And it was constantly on my mind. It just, it was just nagging at me all the time. She never went back to gambling because I dared to do something I thought was wacky because God was telling me to do that thing that I thought was wacky. And because he wanted to open up a whole new ministry and a whole new mindset to me. Yeah, people are going to judge you and challenge you about your authority. I used to belong to a denomination that said it believed in divine healing. It said it believed in, in, in women in ministry. But it had very few women that were lead pastors. And I didn't see it practicing divine healing. God is calling us. He's calling you. He's calling this church to something beyond the, the ordinary. He's calling us to the extraordinary. John the Baptist clearly made the decision to follow and obey God. And I want to tell you something about John that you might not know or might not have thought about. John was an anointed leader of the old wineskin. Jesus brought in a whole new wineskin. But John was the old wineskin. And even John had trouble with some of the things that were happening uh, to him. John started his ministry before Jesus released the kingdom of God back to humans on the earth. He started his ministry before the Holy Spirit had been given. But think of Jesus' words in Luke 5. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on the old one, otherwise the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. You see, wineskins, when they're new, they're flexible, they can stretch, they can mold, they can transition. But after a while, they become uh, brittle, and you put new wine in an old wine skin, it starts to ferment, it starts to expand, and it destroys the old wine skin. So Jesus said, but put new wine, must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires a new, for he says the old is better. John was tempted to keep on drinking from the old wine skin because he thought it was better. Remember when John was put in prison and he sent some of his disciples to say, Jesus, are you the one? He was starting to doubt the new things that Jesus was doing. Are you the one or should we look for someone else? And yet something was stirring in John the Baptist even though he was born in an old religious wine skid, brought up according to the way things had always been done, something in him knew that there was more. He knew he had a call on his life. He dared to be different. He, he dared to follow the Lord without seeking personal fame. John the Baptist was at the beginning of a new season. I believe we are at the beginning of a new season. The oil flowing more and more from, from Shelby's hands. Oil is now uh, flowing from Alan's hands. The, the testimony that, that 
that, that Stacy gave today, the, the word that, that Jeff gave today. We're in a new stage and God is saying, you're not going to get what you want until you start going where I'm telling you to go, speaking what I'm telling you to speak, doing what I'm telling you to do. You need to allow me to stretch you and move you and challenge you and fill you and use you in ways that you're not yes ready or, or used to being used. Isn't it time to, that we realize that the revival we are crying out will not be a revival of the old pattern? Going to church as usual won't bring revival any quicker than John could have if he would have worn Levi's and been caught up in religious tra tradition rather than following God with his own heart. And then John chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it shows how John kept things in proper perspective. Uh, verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there's one among you whom, whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. John baptized people with water under repentance. He prepared people to follow Jesus. He did not baptize them because they were already saved like we do as New Testament Christians. He was preparing them, preparing a way for Jesus to introduce a whole new wineskin. There is a call going out from heaven for old people and young people and even children to, who will find out what God created them to do and created them to be and begin to walk in it until they fully understand it. I love that verse. We memorize, for by grace are you say through faith that not of yourselves, it too is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But somehow we have failed to memorize the very next verse. That, that for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works which he prepared. Uh, I got to do it out of the end. I'm be prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, every person sitting here has a prophetic destiny. And if you want to have all you can get out of life, you find out who you are and who God created you to be and what he created you to do and start doing it or start preparing to do it. And then you'll walk in them. And then John 1.28, I love this. I will read it in just a minute. John 128 challenges to start where we are. Can I give you a really big secret? People say, well, God, you can't bless me. Not in this marriage. Not in this house. Not in the job. God can't bless me there. God can't bless me in this church. He can't bless me in this school. Let me tell you a secret. God will never bless you where you're not. If God's going to bless you, he's going to bless you where you are. Quit complaining and keep walking toward the promised land. Verse 28, these things were done in Beth, Bethabara, Bethany, we know it as, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. I leave you with a question. You have to start somewhere. Why not here? You have to start sometime. Why not now? Don't expect God to use you where you're going until you let him use you where you are. Expect him to use you where you are. Last week, I really wanted to show you a YouTube song on video, and I couldn't because the power went out. Man, we've been having struggles. Have you heard we got broke into? This week, Monday night, somewhere between 9 o'clock Monday night and um, Tuesday morning, some vandals broke in the, the side door, the entrance door here, pried in, they came in, broke into my office. I'm still finding things that they stole. I knew they stole. Uh, somebody had left $150 there for me to pick up the next morning. 
gone. Left it in a really precious little knife I had, a utility knife. It was a special one, gone. This morning I looked for my flashlight that I used to look around when I come in really early, gone. And then I needed to use a screwdriver for something. I looked for my little pack of screwdriver, gone. We're, look around. If there's anything you see that's missing, tell me about it. I, we probably won't get anything back, but at least we'll know what was taken. Been quite a week, hasn't it? I praise God for one thing. We felt violated, especially Pam's room. Her office, they trashed everything. She had 15 really old silver dollars with some momentums, mementos of her father who died many years ago. They trashed all through that. They took the, the quarter collection that she and McKenna had been working on. But they found a little bit, and so they wanted to see if there was more. And they just, everything in there was torn up. But you know what? We didn't sweat. Didn't get mad. Felt violated, but we didn't get mad. We didn't get angry. Prayed for the guy. And I didn't pray that God would give him boils on his butt. I prayed that God would lead him to conviction and, and confession and, and salvation. But anyways, I had this song for you, and Adam, if you get that up, and uh, I'd love to have you sing, and you sing better if you stand up. So uh, when it takes off, you just stand up and sing, and then remain uh, standing, and I'll release a blessing. <laughs> 